Hello, I'm Only Jax, and today I wanted to bring you a video about something that troubles me deeply. Ever since I was introduced to the idea uh, from a Turkey Tom video where Hypnotist Sappho, a uh, online VTuber, came out as a zoophile. I want to clear the air and say that, for the record, I am a zoophile. You did not mishear that. I am a zoophile. And this is something that, since I've heard of it, has stressed me out that these people exist. I know, as long as I'm not a zoophile, I have nothing to be stressed out about. Um, but where these people exist, and I think this is a problem. Uh, so in today's video, I'd like to draw attention to the, uh, I want to say, practice of zoophilia um, to ultimately condemn it, and as well as to make a few statements about how this is objectively wrong. Uh, I started my research by looking at the Zooier Than Thou podcast, and I say this at risk of, listen, this video is not going to hit the algorithm, I'm not worried about it, but I say this at risk of introducing people who would be into this stuff uh, to this stuff. Uh, it's a podcast that's on YouTube that promotes zoophilia, which is horrifying in its own right. Uh, and for whatever reason, I, I don't know if they just have YouTube terms of service just on there, but I'm pretty sure last I heard uh, that promoting zoophilia or bestiality or sex with animals in general is a uh, is a bad thing and not allowed on the platform. However, it's con it continues to exist. It's interesting. The podcast that they post, let me look it up here. I'm going to be put on a fucking watch list for looking this up again. Okay, so they have 790 subscribers, which I think is a good thing considering how many people use the program. Uh, they haven't even broken 1K. However, uh, they do consistently upload. Um, their last upload was three weeks ago. The one before that was a month ago. The one before that was two months ago. So they are consistently making content. And listen, I, I this whole thing is so tone deaf. I feel like within the zoophile community, there's just a lack of self-awareness. Um, because I feel like the normal thing is, hey, I'm attracted to animals. This is something that's wrong. Uh, let me go talk to a therapist about this. There are therapists who can talk therapy you out of zoophilia. But that's beside the point. I don't want to say that this video has no bias because it absolutely does. Sex with animals is wrong. Always. So this topic uh, disturbed me so much that I decided to, I don't want to say this, I decided to go down the rabbit hole. Not literally, because that would be awful, but I went down the uh, research pit that is zoophilia, and I would like to say that I did more research and that I'm more well-informed, but I'm going to be honest with you, I couldn't do this for more than a couple hours before I was feeling sick to my stomach. I did find a huge uh, zoophile website called zoocommunity.org, and I started looking around the forums, um, and I was directed to an uh, article by uh, someone writing under a pseudonym called Zoophilia is Morally Permissible. Um, this person, whoever it is, we don't know because they write under a pseudonym. Uh, we'll call them what they want to be called with their fake name. Uh, Fira Bensto uh, writes an article where they basically state Zoophilia is morally permissible. Am I the only one who thinks this is awful? The problem with these people is that they like to use big science words and kind of like tug at your emotions and like abstract philosophy. I find uh, philosophy is a really, really good thing. But when you get too deep, you start to question what we have as objective morals. Like murder is objectively wrong. Sex with children is objectively wrong. Always. Sex with animals is objectively wrong. But when you go down the philosophy of it, you find that there are really two schools of thought. Either you have an objective moral, which is set by God or a higher power, or you have a relative moral, which is set by your community. I tend to think that the objective moral is more accurate uh, because man corrupts absolutely every time. Um, this is why we have a constitution, something in writing versus, hey, let's uh, let's uh, talk to this one guy. Let's ask the president to make a decision on everything. No, no, no. We don't turn to the president. We don't turn to the judge. We turn to the constitution. We turn to the laws that we have written because those written words aren't going to corrupt. The people are, right? So it's better to have people interpreting and understanding the objective rather than people making the relative. If that makes sense to you, I could just be sounding like an idiot. But when you get too far down into philosophy, if you're a moral 
objectivist like me, you start to get into this thought where like morals are relative. So like, you know, murdering people uh, is okay in this country, but it's not okay in this country, but it doesn't really matter because it's okay in this country and their relative moral is that this is okay. The group has decided that this is okay. The moral over here is that it's not okay. Um, and so you can see how it's just, it's just a fucking mess. It's rules for thee and rules for thee and not for me is what moral relativity is to the way I think of it. Um, and so when you get down this, when you start using these big words, you get into philosophy, too deep and let yourself think too abstract. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to like censor ideas here. I think the words are best said in this big think article um, called a revolting thought experiment tests the limits of philosophical explanation. Um, they say down here in the article, uh, Ben Stowe's paper is cleverly argued, but in its pages lies a curious philosoph or psychological phenomenon. When you spend a lot of time in the esoteric nooks of an academic paper or topic, you start to think differently. It's as if your eyes have gotten used to the dark, and when someone turns on the lights, it's blinding and painful. The same is true for a lot of controversial ideas. They are initially convincing and hard to rebut, yet they leave you with a bitter aftertaste of sophistry. Sophistry meaning the use of fallacious arguments, especially with the intent of deceiving, according to Oxford languages. Uh, they say, our moral compass is not exclusively nor even predominantly defined by rational philosophizing. The laws that govern society are even less so. As the journalist Aaron McIntyre argues, this is not always a bad thing because rationality is not the only way in which we interact with society. McIntyre discusses the issue of moral prejudices, which establish taboos for certain things. It might be hard to philosophically disallow necrophilia, cannibalism, zoophilia, and sibling incest, but our collective prejudices have little trouble in doing so. A popular position is to say, well, let's disregard prejudices, their superstitious nonsense that fueled witch hunts in the Dark Ages. McIntyre's point, though, is that these prejudices, formed through cultural, historical, and emotional context, act as bulwarks against moral chaos. Our moral norms are not argued in papers. They have been developed over millennia. Just because we cannot immediately see the point of something does not mean we should burn it down. Often, moral barriers are placed there for a reason and placed well ahead of the actual danger. Anyway, in my research, I found this article that zoophilia is morally permissible as a good, as a, as a, almost like a cornerstone in the zoophilia community. And I wanted to kind of break it down point by point by someone who has like a rational brain. I don't want to call these people animals because that would only validate their choices. Um, but I do think there's a severe lack of self-awareness, like, or it's, it's just morally bankrupt to have sex with animals. Like, we'll get into power dynamics and stuff like this, but um, we'll, we'll just start into the article. Zoophilia is morally permissible. The introduction says, Sex with animals is a powerful social taboo that exposes its practitioners to utmost indignation and stigma. Zoophilia is one of the few sexual orientations, along with necrophilia or pedophilia, that remains off-limits and have been left aside from the sexual liberation movement in the past 50 years. Um, I want to be clear on something. Zoophilia is not a sexual orientation. Whether you agree with, you know, the LGBTQ movement or not, um, I feel like lumping zoophilia in with that group of people because LGBTQ is a group of sexual orientations well, and then trans, which isn't exactly an orientation. It's more of a way of expression. Um, but lumping zoophilia into this, uh, if you're a fan of this movement, if you're a big supporter, if you're an ally, adding Zoophilia into this, I just want you to know, lowers the entire status of the group. You are lowering the tides by adding these people in. It's very dangerous to think like this because the LGBT community already has so much to deal with. They've got bigots up their ass. They've got dudes. Okay, that's not funny. They've got bigots up their ass. They've got the Westboro Baptist Church. They've got all this kind of stuff where they've been trying to be liberated, liberated, liberated. Um, if you add zoophilia, if it becomes LGBTZ, you are making it so much harder. So much harder. Because now you have to sell that, right? Um, it's been, zoophilia has been left behind out of this group for good reason. It is not a good practice. Anyway. Benito says, I would like to argue this as a mistake. There is, in fact, nothing wrong with having sex with animals. It is not an inherently problematic sexual practice. 
Given the sheer outrage that the mere mention of zoophilia triggers in many people, we might expect this case for its permissibility to be a hard sell. This is not so. Not only do I think that zoophilia is morally permissible, but I also think that the case in its favor is rather straightforward, so that it should be the default position in many philosophical quarters. This makes it all the more surprising that no ambitious and explicit defense of it has been published so far. Um, the reason that no uh, ambitious and explicit defense has been published for it because it's fucking wrong. It's always wrong when you do it. I guarantee you, even if you are a zoo, there's a reason these people don't come out to their families and friends because they know it's wrong. Shame is a very useful tool for keeping society in check, if that makes sense. Um, so the reason there is not an ambitious and explicit defense of zoophilia is because it is shameful it is wrong you are opening yourself up to public shame and scrutiny by doing this this is not a good thing what is zoophilia by zoophilia i mean human engagement in romantic and or sexual relationships with non-human animals we can distinguish between zoophilic activities term bestiality being sometimes used to refer to zoophilic sexual activities and zoophilic orientation understood as a general attitude of romantic or sexual attraction to some animals which disposes one to engage in zoophilic activities. As an orientation, sometimes referred to as zoosexuality, zoophilia can thus be compared with other orientations such as heterosexuality or bisexuality. No, it fucking can't. Here's the thing. Heterosexuality, bisexuality, homosexuality, queer sexuality, lesbian, gay, whatever. All of those have to do with human-on-human -human contact, human-on-human -human orientation. Asexuality means you're attracted to no humans. Well, maybe like physically, but not like sexually attractive to any humans. Um, zoo sexuality cannot be compared with other orientations because it has to do specifically with animals. This is apples. This is apples and oranges. They're not the same thing. They both involve sex, but it can't be compared to other orientations. This is a fucking baseless claim. This is a baseless claim. This is stupid. This is actually stupid. Zoophilia can thus be compared with other orientations such as heterosexuality or bisexuality and should accordingly be distinguished from mere fetishes. That's wrong. That is wrong. That is so wrong. The basic definition calls for several comments. First, zoophilia covers a variety of romantic and sexual activities. The latter are not limited to vaginal or anal penetration, but also include masturbation, oral genital contact, fraudage, zoophilic voyeurism, etc. Second, I leave open the possibility for zoophiles to engage only in non-sexual activities, such as displays of affection or caring behaviors, but it is sexual activities that are usually considered to be morally problematic, so most of my arguments will concern sexual activities. Third, there might be doubts about the possibility of having a romantic relationship with an animal. Humans sometimes do love their pets, and reciprocally, pets, like dogs, can plausibly be attributed attitudes of love towards human beings. But it is true that what is required for love to count as romantic is debated. Fourth, zoophilia as an orientation comes in different degrees. Zoophiles might have an exclusive attraction for animals or also be attracted to human beings. I don't have much to say to this. I mean, this just sounds like the writings of a fucking madman. Like, it's fucked up that this is even a thing that we're talking about. I don't like how in the second point, say, I leave open the possibility for zoophiles to engage only in non-sexual activities, such as display of affection or caring behaviors. Like, what do you mean by that? That's so fucking vague. By that definition, I'm a fucking zoophile. I have three cats. I give them plenty of shows of affection. We cuddle up almost every night. I scratch their chins because they're fucking adorable. I feed them and I care for them. Uh, those are displays of affection and caring behaviors. Like that's so fucked. It's, it's, it's a, it's a weird argument because it, it's too much of an umbrella. And so what you do is you lump everyone into it and make this seem okay. Well, everyone's a little bit of a zoo file. No, it's the same way when people are like saying it's like, uh, you know, when uh, the LGBT community is like, oh, everyone's a little bit gay or everyone's a little bit lesbian. Like, that doesn't actually isn't the case. I'm not gay at all. I shouldn't say that. I'm a little bit gay. I'm a little, I'm a little gay. So maybe my whole point there is just null and void. But no, 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 no. Uh, I am not a little bit attracted to animals in any sense. Although, here, I, this is funny. I'm wearing this shirt. I got that dog in me. I got that dog in me, baby. I got that dog in me. That's horrifying what I just did.
horrifying. This is the this is the cat who I'm not sexually attracted to, uh, but I give I give affection to and I care for him because I love him. I love him very much. I do not want to have sex with him. He also knocked down my blanket that was keeping me from being backlit. I'm a little mad at him right now, but look at his cute little face. Look at the kitty. Look at the kitty. Fuck zoo files. My orange kitty is sleeping right now, so we won't meet him. But this is Gay Tiger. Gay Tiger, say hi. Say hi to your fans. Ah! Okay, Gay Tiger doesn't want to be on the camera. I love him to death. Cats are fucking gross, though. I love them, but they're gross. They shit inside. I have to scoop their fucking litter box. That's care. That's care and affection that I scoop their fucking shit. Let's continue. Zoophilia is the object of widespread social ostracism, especially in its arguably more visible sexual component. We can already find in the Old Testament several passages which portray bestiality as a crime against nature. I like that. I like that they say that. So even God says this is not okay. This is bad. Hundred bucks says after God made the Ten Commandments, because I think, yeah, a hundred bucks says that uh, God kind of wishes he would have put that as an 11th commandment because the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus. The next book, Leviticus, talks about a bunch of rules and everything for the uh, Israelites. <laughs> Leviticus 20, uh, verses 15 and 16. If a man has sex with an animal, he must be put to death and the animal must be killed. If a woman presents herself to a male animal to have intercourse with it, she and the animal must be put to death. You must kill both for they are both guilty of a capital of offense. I'm obviously not saying that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that what I am saying is that even God says this is a fucking horrible thing to do. Guarantee you he would have put that as an 11th commandment, but people just had to start fucking animals, right? You can't get, you can't get laid. So you start banging a cow. Like what the fuck is that? God thinks it's a crime against nature. Come on, come on. Let's continue. Various forms of sex with animals are currently outlawed in numerous jurisdictions. Good. The I think they should be outlawed in more. Though increased tolerance and decriminalization have been observed in Western countries in the 20th century, mainly as a collateral effect of sexual liberalization. More recently, a significant trend of recriminalization, love it, example in Germany, France, and some U.S. states, has taken place. This time under additional pressure of animal rights activists who have generally expressed intense hostility to zoophilia. I wonder what PETA has to say to Zoophilia. What does PETA have to say? PETA bestiality. Oh, good. Something we can agree with PETA on. PETA says, Consensual sex is between two human beings who enter into it willingly, and that is never the case when an animal is dominated by a human. Having sex with an animal is raping that animal. Something PETA has found in numerous eyewitness exposés of factory farms and slaughterhouses. Animals do not have a choice, and cruelty to animals is illegal in all 50 states. Did you hear that? Zoophilia, having sex with animals, is rape. And we continue. Scientific approaches to zoophilia have often been premised on the wrongdoings of zoophilia, as they should. To take just one example, in veter veterinary science, the concept of animal sexual abuse is construed as including all sexual contact between people and animals, thus effectively taking a stand against all forms of sex with animals. Love to hear that. That is, just, that is an objectively good thing. Zoophilia has also been heavily pathologized and treated as a mental disorder, as it fucking should. It was introduced as paraphilia in the diagnostics or the DSM-3 in the DSM-3 in 1980. The DSM-3. I think we're on the DSM-5 now. Oh, is it still in there? Yep. It's in the DSM-5. That's awesome. It is. I don't think it's in any particular order, um, but it's in between necrophilia, sexual activity with corpses, uh, and corporophilia, being aroused by being shit on or shitting on other people. Sandwich right in between. Right in between. That's great. I love that. Why do my hands look so dirty? It's just the color temperature of my light. I swear to God, these my hands are not this dirty. We continue. Despite the social consensus against zoophilia, there is evidence of zoophilic practices and representations in many societies. Numerous myths and folklore traditions, for example, contain anthropomorphic characters and depictions of sexual relationships between animals and humans. Listen, dude. There's also numerous myths of fucking centaurs and whatever you call the people with 
fucking centaurs and minotaurs, like myths and folklore. Like it's a fucking story, dude. It's made up. It's not fucking real. The prevalence of zoophilia in the general population, however, is difficult to establish due to the paucity of research on the topic. There's not a whole lot of research because this isn't something we need to be studying. Most scientific studies of zoophiles are based on convenient samples of self-identified zoophiles on the internet or focus on forensics, notably sex offenders, or clinical populations. Are you telling? Is this what you're saying? Not that you can defend yourself here. Um, are you saying that the data you're getting about who is a zoophile are coming from uh, sex offender registries? That's how I seem to understand this. I could be wrong. An inaugural study by Kinsey and colleagues found that 8% of male and 3.5% of the female U.S. populations had at least one sexual interaction with an animal in their life, with percentage exceeding 50% in some rural locations. I fucking hate that. I fucking hate that. But even to say just because people are doing it does not mean that it's correct. People kill people all the time. Something Something like X percent of the population has fucking shot someone. Something like... X percent of the population has raped someone. Just because people are doing it does not make that inherently correct. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? One major factor driving the prevalence of zoophilic activity is simply access to animals. Though the rural population has had easier access to farm animals, the increased number of pets have offered new opportunities for the urban population to engage in sex with animals too. Blech. With dogs being by far the most common species that zoophiles have relationships with. Oh, so you're telling me a weak animal, an animal that I can exert power over, that we have access to, is the most common species that zoophiles have a relationship with. It's not like, it's because fucking animals, dogs are easy targets. Guarantee you no one's ever had sex with a fucking mountain lion. Because you can't exert physical power over it. I guarantee you no one's ever had sex with a bear. Because a bear would maul your fucking face. A more recent survey <laughs> suggests that 2% of the general population find the prospect of having sex with animals sexually arousing. While a popular non-academic survey, N equals 43,000. Does that mean the, the sample size? So yes, N means sample size. So while a popular non-academic survey with a sample size of 4,300, sorry, 430,000 probably skewed towards a sex positive population finds that 11% of the male and 7% of the female respondents have some sexual interest in horses and around 18% of male respondents and 11% of the female respondents express some sexual interest in penetrating an animal. So you looked at 430,000 people probably skewed one way with a bias so i'm i'm i didn't take statistics in high school but i do know that these numbers are bullshit you've already established like to get to get a sample size you need to like this ugh. i was under the impression you needed a larger sample size with a more broad way of thinking people what you've done is you're justifying these people think it's okay Already this amount of people are doing it. And so thus it must be okay. It's already happening. This is an this is such a stupid argument. This doesn't make any sense. You're asking people who you know are gonna be aligned with your view, hey, what do you think about this? And eleven percent of them are thinking, yeah, this is okay. Fucking stupid. The appeal of zoophilia is also reflected in the wealth of zoo pornography that can be found on the internet. Zoophilia, it turns out, is more common than we might think. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And I think you saying that is trying to soften the blow of something horrible. It's so dumb. It's so fucking dumb. I like this next line. Many people who have sex with animals do not, strictly speaking, have a zoophilic orientation, but use animals as surrogates for human sex partners. Someone can't get laid, and so they're going to bang their dog, is what that means. I cannot get pussy to save my fucking life, so I'm going to bang my dog. I'm going to bang my fucking dog, dude. I'm going to bang my dog. I got that dog in me. I got that fucking dog in me. Like, this is so morally bankrupt. In this case, sexual activities with animals often have an experimental dimension and might be a passing phase during teenage years. Stop using language that normalizes this. Let me know in the comments if you had a, uh, uh, a zoophile phase in your teenage years. Man, that golden shepherd's looking good today.
looking good today. I want that dog in me. I want that dog in me. In contrast, zoophilia does constitute a more full-fledged sexual orientation for other people. What the fuck does that mean? In contrast, zoophilia does constitute... I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep going. With the advent of the internet, groups of zoophiles have coalesced into a budding social movement, sometimes represented by the Greek letter Zeta, which puts animal welfare and preferences on center stage and firmly condemns any form of zoo sadism and abuse. Calling themselves zoos, they urge that their orientation be acknowledged as a legitimate sexual identity alongside other already recognized sexual identities. This is fucked. They put animal welfare and preferences on center stage and firmly condemn any form of zoo sadism and abuse. It's all abuse. They condemn any form of zoo sadism, zoo sadism and abuse. Zoo sadism. Let's get a definition for that going. I know what it is, but my um, zoo sadism definition. Zoo sadism is a term used to refer to the pleasure that an individual gains from cruelty to animals. Zoo sadism is getting sexually excited by causing harm to animals is what the internet says this is what being ai says um so yeah no zoo sadism and abuse they're lumping those two things into different categories zoophilia having sex with animals is abuse section two debating zoophilia the eth ethics of zoophilia have been subject to little academic attention so far we might think at first that zoophilia is so obviously wrong that there is no discussion whatsoever needed. But that is not the case. Actually, that is exactly the case. Those who have addressed the ethical status of zoophilia confess that most existing arguments for the wrongfulness of zoophilia are lacking. Cite your source. He has one source. Two sources. He cites two sources. So two people you found said that, um... Okay, sure. Sure. Those who have addressed the ethical status of zoophilia sometimes confess that most existing arguments for the wrongfulness of zoophilia are lacking. Two people fucking said that. Two people. My knowledge, only three authors working on ethics have expressed some degree of sympathy with zoophilia. Singer, in his notorious article, Heavy Petting, takes a broadly utilitarian approach to question why sex with animals should be a crime if the animal is not coerced or harmed. The animal is always coerced. Attributes are hostility to sex with animals to specious prejudice. Brother, I'm gonna come out. I'm, I'm gonna come out. I think the human race is number one, baby. I think we are the absolute best. We, human race, we're number one, baby. We are number fucking one. We are the best in the world, okay? We do everything good. We, we make awesome food. We invent things. We think about things. We build houses. We, uh, we have governments, we go to war, okay? We've been to space, we went to space. Now, albeit a couple of animals have went to space, but who put them there, baby? Humans, number one. Yeah, I'll say it, I'll say it, I'm a fucking species. If, be, if me being a species means that I, if, if thinking it is wrong and morally bankrupt to have sex with animals means that I am a species, fuck yeah, baby. Continuing, Rudy takes queer theory as her standing point and uses zoophilia to question the uh, demarcation between sex and non-sex. Finally, Burke provides a groundbreaking discussion of various aspects of zoophilia in order to think through ways of cultivating more kind and caring relationships between different species. All three deny that they are defending zoophilia and fall short of claiming zoophilia is permissible because they are good people. This is a lot of shit, dude. My claim will be more assertive and ambitious. I would like to argue that zoophilia is permissible, i.e. that it is not wrong to engage in zoophilia. To do this, I will take for granted a broadly anti-speciest or non-anthropocentric anthropocentric perspective that rejects human exceptionalism. Newsflash for you, dude. Humans are fucking exceptional. We do a bunch of cool shit. Oh, man. Anything good in your life. You owe to a human. Only humans can have conversations like this. Makes us a little exceptional. Makes us a little responsible for making sure that we take care of this earth and the other things that are in it. Makes us a little responsible for making sure we don't abuse animals. Makes us a little responsible for not having sex with fucking animals, dude, because we know better.
There's going to be an example later on where it's Alice and her dog. And I want to say this now. It is Alice's responsibility to fucking know better. Okay? We are exceptional. And my main point for this, my main argument, is because we have the power. We have wisdom and we fucking know better. But here's the thing. We're too fucking smart. So I think one of our biggest downfalls is we can think too abstractly to where the abstract thoughts you're having are well short of productive. This is that. This is prime example. We're in way too deep. We're too abstract with ideas that we couldn't possibly fathom that with shit we couldn't possibly understand. And we start thinking that zoophilia and bestiality and having sex with animals is okay. This is what this gets you. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting fucking heated. Your perspective ascribes some inherent value or rights to animals and refrains from appealing to tradition, status quo, human or animal essence, or God to reason about ethical issues. This allows us to circumvent a number of objections against zoophilia, which usually focus on the human side of the relationship and take zoophilia to be a vice, a sexual perversion, or to go against Christian morality or human essence. I like how you singled out Christianity there. Pretty sure having sex with animals is a crime in Islam. Um, I don't know what the Buddha has to say about it, but I don't think it has anything to do with achieving... Uh, 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 what's it called? What does he do? What does the Buddha do? He transcends. I don't think having sex with animals, uh, is going to progress you in achieving enlightenment. I think the Buddha would say that's not exactly something you should be doing. Um, actually the Buddha would say that all desire is keeping you from keeping, uh, is all desire keeps you from enlightenment. So sex with animals, I would argue is bad there too. Um, so it's not just Christian morality. It's not just Islam morality. It's not just Zen Buddhism. Um, I would imagine that the native Americans would also think it's wrong. I don't have anything to say there though, but I, I would imagine they would say that's wrong. Um, thanks for singling me out. I feel, I feel a little singled out. Although I will say, I also think that Christian morality is a good overall morality. Uh, interesting that they say Christian morality because they brought up Leviticus. That's a Jewish thing. That's a book. That's one of the books of Moses. This is not to say that zoophilia cannot be defended with an anthropocentric approaches. In fact, perhaps the easiest way to conclude that there is nothing wrong with zoophilia is to postulate that humans have a vastly higher moral standing than animals, so that zoophilia is just one instance among many others of permissible use and exploitation of animals for human purposes. That is fucked. I do think it is permissible for us to raise cattle and slaughter them for food. I think that's okay. As long as we're not having sex with them before we slaughter them or after or at any point during the cow's existence, I think, I think it's okay to exploit cows for food. I think that's okay. I think hunting is a okay. I think all of that is good. I, I hate factory farming because that is actual abuse. Um, again, it's like what I was saying earlier. Human exceptionalism also places a responsibility on us to if you're going to raise cattle for slaughter and meat production, if you're going to own a dog, if you're going to go fishing, at any point in all of this, you cannot abuse the animal. We know better. We have empathy. We have sympathy. We understand consent. Okay? And you're not... That's just a, that's a twisted, that's a twisted fucking way of using that. Alternately, uh, we might proceed in a comparative manner and argue that if current practices involving animals are not wrong, then zoophilia is not wrong either. No, this is a powerful argument, but I do not want to accept this premise that current practices involving animals, examples, factory farming are not wrong. So the goal is to assess whether zoophilia lives up to a more demanding moral yardstick. We mentioned earlier that zoophilia comes in many different forms. The, this diversity is a problem insofar as not all forms of zoophilia have the same ethical status. It is clear that some instances of zoophilia are wrong. I would argue all. Activities highly harmful to animals, such as most instances of human penetration of chickens, are obviously permissible.
might take this to contradict my general claim that zoophilia is permissible, but this would be a mistake. That zoophilia is permissible does not mean that all instances of zoophilia are permissible. In the same way that the permissibility of heterosexuality does not mean that all instances of heterosexuality are permissible. Right. Right. Right, 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 right. Uh, let me break that down. Saying that heterosexuality is permissible is correct. Saying that rape is correct, heterosexual rape is correct, is uh, not permissible. That's not permissible. However, what with zoophilia, it's always rape. It is rather meant is that there is nothing intrinsic to zoophilia in its romantic or sexual aspects that makes it wrong. This is fucked. This is wrong. Moreover, what makes some instances of zoophilia wrong is the same kind of conditions, such as harm or lack of consent, that make other activities, including sexual activities, wrong. This is what I intend to establish. No, this is a res that now this result would be of little practical significance if it turned out that all or merely or nearly all actual zoophilic activities were impermissible. But I do not think this is so. A significant proportion of actual zoophilic activities are permissible too. Consider the following case. This is the Alice and her dog uh, example. Alice and her dog. Alice self-describes as being in a romantic relationship with her dog. <laughs> I would say Alice needs help. She cares a lot about his well-being and strives to ensure that his needs are fulfilled. This is not that weird. I care about my three cats as well-being, and I strive to ensure that their needs are met. I have been so broke that I buy cat food and not food for myself as to make sure my fucking cats are fed. This is my responsibility as the exceptional human, as the Superman, as the Ubermensch. I must feed my cats because they cannot feed themselves. I often sleep together. I sleep with my cats all the time. Uh... They all like to snuggle with me right on that bed there, and I wake up and I'm like my I'm like a lion in my pride. It's fucking awesome, dude. I'm like fucking Mufasa, asexual Mufasa. I don't have fucking sex with cats. It's disgusting. Often sleep together. He likes to be caressed, and she finds it pleasant to gently rub herself on him. Sometimes, when her dog is sexually aroused and tries to hump her leg, she undresses him and lets him penetrate her vagina. This is gratifying for both of them. I'm going to give you a second. Because when I first read this, I was like, well, maybe it's a double standard. Right? Because I had gotten so far into this philosophical thinking where I'm like, okay, well, maybe this isn't as bad. It is. It fucking is. This is disgusting. We should know better. This is bad. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Alice's story describes a kind of relationship commonly described within the Zeta movement where there is reciprocal emotional attachment between the human and the animal and sexual contacts are sexually gratifying to both of them. It is tempting to think that Alice's relationship illustrates one way in which humans can develop more equal and non-exploitative relationships with animals that go beyond our negative duties not to harm them. What Alice's story also illustrates is that there is a continuity between zoophilia and affectionate relationships that ordinary people have with their pets. What is it that makes affectionately caressing one's cat of a different ethical standing than sexually caressing one's cat? Oh, I think you just pointed it out. I'm affectionately caressing my cat. If I go grab one of my cats like I did earlier and I'm affectionately holding them, right? That's fine. There's no sexual component. It becomes twisted when it's sexual. Because now you're taking advantage of them. You're taking advantage of quite literally a lower life form, a less intelligent life form, for your own fucking gain. Now, do they get pleasure out of it? I don't know. Is it rape if they like it? Is it? Those are all the same argument to me. Oh, what if it's sexually gratifying? Well, what if, is it rape if they still like it? Right? What if the rape felt good? Is it no longer rape? It's fucking rape. It's what it is. It's animal rape. Yes, that is the difference. Affectionately caressing one's cat is not exploitative. It is not taking advantage of one. Petting a fucking dog affectionately is not taking advantage of them. 
rubbing yourself, rubbing your, rubbing your vagina up against a fucking dog is exploitative and is taking advantage of a lower life form. Morally, it is bankrupt. And you fucking know better. That's why you wrote this under a pseudonym. Because you didn't want to get fucking called out for this. You didn't want people emailing you about this and you didn't want to get up on your fucking horse. You didn't want to get up on your podium and fucking defend this to the public. Because you know this is morally reprehensible. This is wrong. If there is no clear-cut boundary between the ordinary love that pet keepers express and the romantic love that some zoophiles express, then why accept one and not the other? I've, I've, I laid that out pretty clear in my last argument. Pretty fucking clear. Pretty fucking clear. I want to get up and like sit up on my knees. I got that dog in me. Before I turn my attention to the objections that have been raised against zoophilia, I should point out that I am not interested here in the psychological and social factors that explain our ordinary aversion towards zoophilia. Though I suspect that such factors permeate in most attempts at proving zoophilia is wrong, I leave them to social scientists and psychologists. Great. So I know what you're not. I think one of us has a better head on our fucking shoulders. Two crucial questions have dominated the ethical discussion around zoophilia. First, does zoophilia harm animals? Yes. Second, can animals meaningly consent to sex with humans? No. No, they can't. I will discuss each of them in the next sessions. In the course of doing so, I will also point out some dubious claims that have underlain most objections to zoophilia. This is your intermission. Take your intermission now. Because it doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. It, it gets worse. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. Section 3. Harm. One important worry is that having sex with animals would harm them. This is a legitimate worry. I'm glad you acknowledge so. It is beyond doubt that some sexual practices do harm the animal involved. Whether this is the primary intention of the human participant in the case of zoosadism or not, any penetrative effects on rabbits or chickens is likely to severely harm them. Is this where you draw the line at rabbits and chicken? I think it's interesting that you draw the, the line there. Of course, they go on to say that this, however, is not enough to establish that zoophilia is wrong. Right. 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 Right, right, right. What critics of zoophilia need to show is that harm is a necessary feature of sex with animals. This is a very demanding claim. Why do we need to show that? Why do we need to show that? The burden of proof is not on us to say that uh, harm is a necessary feature of sex with animals. I believe that it is, um, whether we know it or not. Um, but why is the burden on proof? Why is the burden of proof on us for that? Just interesting. This is a very demanding claim, which seems to be patently false at first glance. Many sexual interactions with animals, such as that between Alice and her dog, do not seem to cause any pain, bodily damage, or psychological distress. In fact, there is sometimes positive evidence that the animal is having a pleasant experience. Uh, I am noting here how you do not have a source for this. That is anecdotal at best. Okay? And sure, I'll agree with you. If a dog is humping, if a dog wiener is humping a human vagina, sure. That could be a pleasant experience. It's still rape. Because this would be a lot like saying what critics of rape need to show is that harm is a necessary feature of rape. Again, is it still rape if she likes it? I think it is. I think that's absolutely the case. And I think that's the same. I think that's the same kind of twisted fucking question. I think that's the same argument. I really do. Animals can't consent. It's always wrong. Continuing, insisting that all instances of sex with animals produce an immediate harm appears dubious, but we still maintain that there are other ways in which it harms them. Perhaps it has negative long-term consequences on their well-being, but what kind of long-term harm would be inflicted when no harm is inflicted during the activity? I hate this.
Human beings might be harmed in the long run by a sexual interaction because it perturbs their subsequent development as persons and alters their psychological makeup, or because they reevaluate through time what they have experienced as in it and its appropriateness. Animals, however, do not have the complex psychological lives of parad paradigmatic human beings, as well as their intricate social norms around sexuality, so that we should be very wary of excessive anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism on this matter. As Burke notes, the dog who approaches and voluntarily mounts a human is following his own species-specific meaning, so he does not incur the risk of future harm that humans might occur or incur. I'll agree. The dog who approaches and voluntarily mounts a human is following a instinctual, primal fucking like instinct to hump. Dogs will also hump pillows. Dogs will also hump other dogs. I've had my leg humped by a dog. It was fucking horrifying. And your knee-jerk reaction, I, your knee-jerk fucking reaction when that's happening is to kick him off. Right. So he is following his own species-specific meaning. That does not mean that it is not our job as humans to correct wrong behavior. Dogs should hump dogs. When dogs hump things that are not dogs, we humans generally get them to stop. It makes us fucking feel weird. It's out. It's, it's not the norm of nature. Dogs hump dogs, right? Um, so when a dog humps a human, it is our responsibility to get them to stop. That is not good behavior. But no. So... I do think the dog is doing what a dog does. A dog humps, but a dog is supposed to hump dogs, right? It's our responsibility to make sure that that happens. If it's going to happen, then that's where it happens. We might argue, though, that even though no harm is reliably caused by having sex with animals, the risk of harm is enough to make such interactions wrong. This argument, let us call it ar the argument from ignorance, is premised on a particularly pessimistic view on our knowledge of the inner lives of animals and our sweeping precautionary principle. The problem with it is that assessing the well-being of animals is far from an insuperable challenge, especially when it comes to face-to-face -face interaction with animals. What critics of zoophilia need to establish is that sex with animals is always too risky for the long-term well-being of animals. No, we fucking don't. We don't need to. Uh, we don't need to establish a risk factor for harming the animals because it's rape. Because it is already rape. Because the animal cannot consent, cannot truly consent, because for humans to have sex, they need to have human consent. Animals cannot provide human consent. We don't need to establish any sort of risk to the animal because it's rape, because it's taking advantage of them. It's exploiting them for something sick and twisted. So we don't need to explain the harm behind it because it is already rape. It is already off limits for sex to happen in a human context and it's morally permissible human consent needs to happen otherwise it's right anyway they say no such argument to support this has been proposed so far uh, i'd like to see a source for that moreover it is unclear why this argument would apply only to sex if the risk of harm is high enough when having sex with them would it not be high enough too when engaging in other kinds of interactions with them no because other interactions with them aren't rape I agree that we should treat animals with great caution because it is not easy to understand how they feel, especially when we do not know them well. But it is an overreaction to infer from this that having sex with animals is wrong. No, it's not. Nuh-uh. Nuh-uh. It's not an overreaction. Nuh-uh. Fucking bitch. No. I don't want to call these- I don't want to call them, like, animals or bitch or pussy or anything, like, because it would only embolden them. Interestingly, though, sex with animals has often been compared to sex with children to suggest that both are wrong for the same reason it harms them. They actually stand in sharp contrast in this respect. We are justified in thinking that having sex with children always imposes a risk of future harm to them, even if no immediate harm is caused. I'm glad you agree. I'm glad, I'm glad you take the stance that having sex with children is wrong, because for a minute there, I was worried that you didn't. They say, however, this same argument, this same argument fails when it comes to zoophilia. I think when you put the argument like this and you're only talking about 
potential harm. No, they're right. The same argument does fail when it comes to zoophilia because uh, you, we can't know the future harm. We can't know it. I would say, however, it does pose a risk, whether I know what it is or not. I've got a gut feeling about it. Anyway, they continue. There are more subtle ways in which zoophilia might harm animals. Pierce claims that having sex with animals is a form of exploitation because it is. Unfortunately, she says little to support it and, seem, and it seems that unfair conditions of treatment are by no means a pervasive feature of sex with animals. Alternately, we might argue that zoophilia degrades or even violates the animal's dignity. Now, dignity is a notoriously vague normative notion, especially so for animals. In fact, it is not clear that animals have a dignity in the first place. Sure, I don't, I don't think animals have a sense of dignity. That's true. I think they're too underdeveloped for that. I think. I've watched an ape throw its own poop at other apes. What kind of dignity is that? I watched a video in which there's this little baby girl fucking like up against the glass of like a like an ape enclosure and the ape comes up, puts its ass on the glass and shits. Yeah, no, I'm with you there, buddy. Animals don't have a sense of dignity. That's a very human thing to have. Bollinger and Goschel, I'm, I'm, I'm botching that, claim that one important aspect of the dignity of the animal is its sexual integrity. By this, they mean unhindered sexual development and sensation, the protection from damaging decision-making by sexual exploitation of dependencies, and the protection from sexual harassment. They fall short, however, of establishing that zoophilia would necessarily degrade the sexual dignity of the animal in this sense. To make their point, they appeal to the argument from ignorance, which I have already rejected, as well as the notion that zoophilic activities would hinder the free sexual development of an animal, which they, they do not justify in more detail. They, presumis, they presumably think that free sexual development is best displayed in same species sexual relationships, but why would that be so? Overall, we can conclude that more work is needed to get these arguments started. Sure, I'll, I'll meet you in the middle there. I do not think that animals have a sense of dignity or something like that. Um, I do think that uh, an animal's, I think free sexual development of an animal um, is best developed within the same species. Because here, here's a thought experiment. What if Alice's dog kept fucking Alice and then never fucked another dog again? Well... I think you have damaged the integrity, not the dignity, but the integrity of that animal. This whole argument doesn't matter, actually, however, because it's still rape. Finally, <laughs> the one you've all been waiting for. Four, consent. Consent is widely seen as a necessary condition for non-problematic sexual interactions, one that respects our right to autonomy and might even constitute the touchstone of no morally permissible sex. Yes, that is correct. The second major worry about zoophilia is that the animal would not or could not consent to sex with humans. To unravel this argument, it is important to be clear on what consent is in the first place. I will then turn to what makes consent ethically valid. All right, let's hear it. All right, let's hear it. In its most basic form, consent can be defined as a voluntary, i.e. uncoerced, verbal or behavioral indication of agreement to engage in a specific activity or the mental attitude signified by this indication. I think Title IX says that uh, consent must be a enthusiastic verbal consent. I think it's like enthusiastic consent um, or uncoerced consent, and it has to be some sort of verbal thing, I think, legally. Um, animals can't do that, so now your argument is null and void. Um, are there activities to which animals can consent in this sense? The answer is clearly positive. Suppose that during a walk in the forest, I suddenly see a deer. I happen to have some food in my backpack, so I hand it to him, and he comes nearer to eat it. I can safely take this as an indication that the deer consents to being fed by me. Okay, and? You're not exploiting the animal. And, and like, and also, like, don't think of this as consent. You put out food for an animal, and so it eats the food. I don't think that constitutes consent. And this is not a good argument 
for having sex with animals. You put your food out in your hand and a deer comes up and eat it. Okay, that's fine. If I take my dick out in public and a girl comes up and does something with it, I've just committed a sex crime. I'm on a fucking registry now. These are two very different things. This is apples and fucking oranges. We know from the literature on animal communication that a wide range of postures, gestures, sounds, etc. are used by animals to express their needs and intent. Most of us have personal experiences with cross-species communication, including for communicating our intentions to engage in some common activity with them. Take play, for example. Dogs have a special posture known as the play bow that signals to a potential playmate their desire to engage in playful activity. Play is a complex activity that requires playmates to abide by certain rules and to fine tune their behaviors to maintain a playful mood. When it comes to sex, there is also a wide range of species and individual dependent cues that can indicate consent. There is nothing specific about sexual activities that would make either animals unable to consent to them or humans unable to reliably understand this consent. This is not to say that understanding animals is easy. But there is a wide range of circumstances in which that we can reliably access their desires and intentions by paying enough attention to what they try to express. So what it seems like they're saying is that there are behavioral cues, there are social cues, there are certain things that dogs can do or animals can do to express their consent or want to have sex with you. This is the she was asking for it argument. This is, she was wearing a skimpy top, so she was asking for it, argument. An animal cannot effectively communicate consent with you, nor understand what it means to give it. The problem with looking at this from a non-human exceptionalist view is that you now make all animals as intelligent as humans and thus can give the same kind of consent and have the same understanding, which is categorically false. Animals can't talk, dude. It takes a certain level of intelligence to be able to understand how to speak. You also need lips and a tongue that can do what ours do, but you need a certain amount. You need, you need the required hardware and animals do not have it. This is not to say that understanding animals is always easy, but there is a wide range of circumstances in which we can reliably assess their desires and intentions by paying enough attention to what they try to express. The basic claim is sometimes met with resistance from authors drawing on some variant of the argument from ignorance. Just as we would be unable to assess whether a sexual interaction harms the animal, we would be at a loss to assess whether the animal consents to it. This might be taken to trace back a fundamental problem in communicating with animals. Bernie goes so far as to claim that animals are incapable of genuinely saying yes or no to humans in forms that we can readily understand. Regan, in order to criticize Singer's position on zoophilia, expresses similar ideas. An animal cannot say yes or no. In the nature of the case for humans to engage in sexual activities with animals must be coercive, must display a lack of respect, thus must be wrong. I think that's true. That's, that's absolutely accurate. Such claims about the impossibility of communicating with animals, which are very common in discourse about zoophilia, strike me as plainly untenable. Because you want to fuck dogs. That's why they're untenable to you. Whatever. Their ubiquity, however, might be attributable to a more general and deep-seated tendency to deny agency to animals. Bork reminds us humans are positively resistant to treating non-human animals as communicable subjects. This is also noted by Donaldson and Kimlicka, who write that there is an unwillingness to recognize the competencies of domesticated animals for agency, cooperation, and participation in mixed human and animal settings. This is fucked up. Humans are not resistant to treating non-human animals as if they have their own agency. That's just not true. We do assign agency to animals. We do all the time. Um, when my cat earlier, I could tell he didn't want to be held. So I put him down. So that was one of the ones where it's easy to tell, Hey, he's got his own agency. I'm going to let him do his own thing. But let's say you're walking your dog and your dog wants to attack another dog. You are fundamentally stripping the dog of its agency when you pull back on the lease. Because if it were the dog's way, he'd go attack the other dog or another human. So yes, 
there is an unwillingness to give animals a 100% free sense of agency and free will. I do agree with that. However, again, human exceptionalism, I would say, states that we have a responsibility to take care of our environment, to take care of the animals around us, of the animal have the animals around us and that includes keeping them in check and not harming other animals and harming others and also themselves that's why we put a cone around dogs necks when they have a, when they get neutered or they have something where they can't lick we're stripping them of their own agency for their own good and i think that is an absolutely okay way to think about it i think that is absolutely fine because it is a good thing it is widely thought that mere uncoerced sign of agreement is not enough for valid consent. Critics of zoophilia might recognize that animals can consent while still arguing that they cannot satisfy one of the additional criteria that are needed for valid consent, and thus they cannot validly consent. To start with, valid consent might require that the consented action does not harm the consenting individual. Because I've already argued in the previous section that some instances of sex with animals do not harm them, such a no-harm criterion to valid consent could e easily be satisfied. We already heard what I had to say about that. If you're fucking a horse, if you're fucking a horse pussy, if you're fucking a horse vagina, I don't think you're going to physically harm the animal. I don't think it's going to like it. But I don't think you're going to harm it, like physically. I don't think that's the case. So sure, it's still fucking rape. Second, it might be argued that consent can be valid only if the consenting individual has a specific capacity or status that animals would lack. For example, Bellioti, who takes a contractualist view on what makes sex permissible, states that no non-human animal is capable of entering into a valid sexual contract with a human. I, I think that's accurate. This might also be the criterion that Bernie and Regan had in mind when denying that animals can consent. There are two problems with this argument. First, it is unclear what this capacity is and why it would be necessary for consent to be valid. We might think that, say, consciousness or free will are sex capacities. But the former is shared with many animals, and there is much controversy about whether humans themselves have the latter capacity, free will. I think this is fallacious. Like, this is, this is, this doesn't make sense. Like, this is only thrown in here to confuse, I think, this argument. The only reason it's in here is to confuse. Because you're using so many different fucking ideas and, like, loosely associating all of them and putting them into one to the fact that I'm not sure what the first argument was anyway because I got all these other things I got to juggle. Perhaps it is a normative capacity that is required for consent to be valid, such as moral responsibility or the capacity to intentionally waive the right. If we think that animals lack such a cap capacity, then animals could not validly consent. Yes, animals lack moral responsibility and the capacity to waive a right based off of moral responsibility. That's why we have a moral responsibility to not have sex with animals. Yeah. There are tenable positions in principle, but unless we think that valid consent is required only for sexual activity, the fact that animals act a crucial capacity for giving valid consent would probably prescribe many kinds of interactions, some widely believed to be permissible between animals and humans, starting with play. Actually, play is the only thing that you've brought up. It's the only thing you've brought up. Play is not exploitative. It is not morally reprehensible. This would make valid consent a dubious standard for regulating our interactions with animals. I want to say this for the people in the back. This person writes, This would make valid consent a dubious standard for regulating our interactions with animals. Do with that what you fucking will. Bottom line is that either the required capacity does not threaten the validity of animals' consent to sex or valid consent is unnecessary when interacting with animals, in which case it does not threaten the permissibility of sex with animals. I'm going to finish this consent section, and then we're going to be done, because I'm getting too heated, because this is so fucking brain dead, and I'm so glad the majority of people aren't like this. I'm, I, feel, I feel like I'm punching down here, and I, I'm okay with this. This is fucking re morally bankrupt. Morally fucking bankrupt.
Third, valid consent may require that the consenting individual be properly informed about the activity she is consenting to, the identity of the other participants, or its outcomes. Suppose that someone consents to donate an organ based on her understanding that the organ will serve a certain purpose, saving a life, whereas it is actually used for another purpose, training medical students. Though her consent is uncoerced, it is based on a serious misunderstanding and is therefore invalid. Using her organ for training medical students would be wrong. Similarly, when it comes to sex ethics, it has been emphasized that misinformation or even deception about key features of the sexual interaction, example, the identity of the sexual partner, can spoil one's consent. In general, it is often thought that misinformation matters when the consenting individual would not have consented had she been properly informed. In these situations, information plays the role of a deal breaker, i.e. it would have changed the decision of the consenting individual. I can't wait to see how they're going to try to twist this. Is animals' consent to sex with humans misinformed in such a way? Do animals lack crucial information that would have otherwise made them refuse to engage in sex? I struggle to find any reason to think that such misinformation is a conspicuous feature of human-animal sex. Of course, one difficulty is that there may be aspects of the activity that animals do not have the capacity to understand. Yes, an animal fully lacks the capacity to understand the sex and the implication of it with humans. We don't fully understand the implications of it. We fully don't, right? Uh, so with that said, the option for an animal can, to consent to sex should not be on the table, cannot be on the table, because they cannot understand it. They can't understand it. Of course, one difficulty is that there may be many aspects of the activity that animals do not have the capacity to understand. The deer who consents to me feeding him does not understand and does not have the cognitive capacities to understand my complex motivation to hand him food or the stories that I will later tell to my friends about this unusual encounter. The range of information that animals can learn differs from humans. This is not a problem, though, because information that we do not have the capacity to grasp cannot constitute a deal breaker. But it, yes, it does. Yes, it does. They don't know better. They can't know better. And thus, it's our responsibility to know better and to not fucking do it. It's fucking rape. One particular case of misinformation that we might find problematic concerns animals unaware of the sexual character of the activity. Consider, for example, the following case. Bob and his dog. Bob loves his dog. Every Friday when he comes back home, tired from working, he spreads honey on his penis and takes pleasure in letting his dog lick it. Okay, let's redo this. Let's, let's bring in someone else who doesn't uh, have the awareness of the sexual character of this activity. Bob loves his six-year-old son. Every Friday when he comes back home tired from working, he spreads honey on his penis and takes pleasure in letting his son lick it. The son doesn't understand the sexual nature of this. Doesn't understand the sexual character. Is this still rape? Is this still sexual harassment and sexual exploitation? I would argue yes. Absolutely it is. Absolutely. Both parties in this, and what I've brought up, both parties are not fully aware, and I would say blissfully unaware of the sexual character of this activity. It is still wrong. It is still fucking wrong. You are exploiting someone or something that does not fucking know better. Bob's dog may not be aware of the sexual character of the activity he is engaging in, and we might intuitively think that this threatens the validity of his consent. We do intuitively think that because we are fucking smart. This would be true if the sexual character of his action were a deal breaker. This is perhaps the case, but I would like to point out that it is far from obvious. No, it's pretty fucking obvious. Of course, if Bob's dog was a instead a human coaxed into licking Bob's penis, say Bob told him that this was the only way to relieve an itch, the sexual character of the action would probably be a deal breaker. So the information condition would not be satisfied and the validity of his consent would be undermined. This is so because of the specific ways in which humans typically regard sex. I like how they didn't use... <clears throat> So I would say from age zero to around whenever you're given the talk, you don't have an understanding of sex, at least not one where th this could be a factor, right? You conveniently, the author conveniently leaves that out. And that's interesting to me. 
The significance of sex for humans increases the range of potential deal breakers. For many animals, however, there's nothing special about sex. That's true. There's nothing special about sex with animals. Except for ducks. They mate for life. And otters. They mate for life. It's adorable. It's fucking adorable. In order to avoid anthropocentrism, we should be very careful when determining what would be a deal breaker for them, and thereby whether their consent is well informed. They cannot consent. It will always be misinformed. This is recalled by Bork too. There is no reason to insist that animals must possess the same understanding about sex as human participants. In other words, it is important not to frame animal sexuality in human terms. What humans think is sexual might not be for animals involved. They might understand it as being physically groomed, or like if you're fondling an animal, they might see that as you're physically grooming them, fed, ingesting ejaculate, relieved, masturbating, or shown affection. Or indeed, they might barely register the human contact at all. I would argue in nature, dogs are never fed human ejaculate. And so it's very wrong for us to do so. Fourth, we might argue that valid consent requires equal power. Yes. Since in zoophilic activities, humans hold more power than animals, the latter's consent would be invalid. It is true that humans usually exert a pervasive control over the animals' lives, e example, on their existence, their living conditions, their conditions of reproduction, especially in the case of pets and farm animals. Most relationships between humans and animals therefore take place within a latent structure of domination. The importance of power balance for valid consent has been theorized by some feminist philosophers and mostly applied to human sexual activities. McKinnon, for example, emphasizes the importance of entering sexual intercourse as social equals. The idea can be easily translated to human-animal interactions and has in inspired quite a few authors. Haynes, for example, points out that there is something deeply troubling with sexual relationships of unequal power, and he takes this to be a major objection to bestiality. I think all of that is accurate. I think all that's true. I think both sexual partners should come to the table as sexual equals or social equals. I do think consent is lessened when that's not so. Only bold statements on this channel. The problem with such arguments is that it is clear that power asymmetry by itself does not undermine the validity of consent. We'll read on. What is important is rather how it affects consent. This is recalled by McKinnon herself, who notes that for a sexual interaction to count as rape, there must be exploitation of inequalities, i.e. the latter must be deployed as forms of force or coercion in the sexual setting. It is unclear what exploiting power inequalities means exactly, but again, it seems unlikely to be a conspicuous feature of sex with animals. In the absence of any convincing argument to the effect, this objection is unsuccessful. No, 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 no. When do you see a human having sex with an animal more power than the human, more powerful than the human? I guarantee, I said this earlier, I guarantee you, and humans don't have sex with bears or don't have sex with cougars because they can't. Well, okay. Well, it depends on what your definition of a cougar is. I'm talking about mountain lions, cheetahs, jaguars, apes. Humans don't seem to have sex with animals that are more powerful than it. I think power is a huge factor in this. The animals that these people are having sex with are animals that these humans can inflict their power over. In the end, we can conclude that animals can consent to sex with humans. As far as the validity of the consent, the gist of my discussion has been that animals can validly consent according to most conceptions except under the most demanding ones. So when your argument needs to be watertight, it can't meet it you lost and that the latter turn out either to be unacceptable for other reasons or to make valid consent unnecessary to engage with sex with animals given that having sex with animals does not necessarily harm them we can conclude that having sex with animals is not wrong and with that zoophilia is not wrong i've been doing this for two hours i'm done with this fucking article dude i'm done with this article i'm fucking done um I hope you liked it. I hope I didn't sound like too much of a madman. I don't have any hate in my heart for uh, zoo files or people who, for whatever reason, find themselves attracted to animals. I think it's absolutely wrong. Uh, and I think uh, the correct way to go about this is if you know someone who's like this, if someone opens up to you about this, 
I think the correct response is to plead with them to find help. This is wrong. This is bad. This is detrimental. Us as humans who quite clearly dominate this world due to our intelligence, due to our exceptionalism, and I mean all of us, every fucking human is exceptional. And we all have a responsibility to take care of the world around us. You are doing the opposite of that when you decide to objectify an animal and use it to exploit sexually. An animal cannot consent. It is not smart enough to do so. You are punching down when you're doing it. It is so wrong. So wrong. And it doesn't matter if animal welfare is at the center of your heart and you're doing these things. It is wrong. Because at the end of the day, you are exploiting something that is otherwise defenseless. I don't have much more to say about it. I hope this video does not hit the algorithm. I more wanted to kickstart my uh, YouTube career with something that I could go on a lot about and have at least my uh, a, a, a good two cents into. Um, and uh, if you're a further expert on this and want to talk about it, feel free to leave a comment. Please like and subscribe. Uh, I hope this is entertaining for you as it was for me. I want to mention... I, this is not this this video is not an excuse to go after these people and harass them online. I will say a couple of things in this video that do make it seem like I'm saying that. I promise you I'm not. I promise you I'm not. Do not seek these people out. Do not harass them. My only call to action is you if you do know these people personally, I I plead that you plead with them to find help because all of this is wrong. It's a very twisted view of morality and twisted view of uh how we can treat and take care of the world around us um so with that really appreciate it if you stuck it out this long and uh we'll see you for the next one where i talk about something even more awful i don't fucking know